Hey, thanks for checking out the Solid Verbal. Now would be a great time to subscribe to the channel for college football content all off season long. I guess we, I, I wanted to start off this conversation in the same manner as we've started off so many of the other ones. All right. The first question that I've been asking people is A through F grade the coaches for a season. I think it's pretty obvious that Sonny Dykes was an A. He was 58 points away from the highest possible grade last season. So we can assume an A and we can talk about why that came to fruition. Where I wanted to start, though, was just lay the groundwork for us a little bit. The end of the Gary Patterson era. Let's start the conversation there. The guy's got a statue on campus, Parker. It is really hard to break up with guys who have their own statues. So obviously it reached a point of diminishing returns over the span of a couple seasons with Patterson. Can you give us a sense for what happened towards the end? What led to that resignation? What led us to this spot where now we got to pick a new coach in Fort Worth? Yeah, so I, I start this. I've had this conversation a, a lot over the last year, obviously, um, with with you know how well TCU season went, and I, I start this conversation every time saying I have nothing but the utmost respect for Gary Patterson. He's one of the all time college football coaches and program builders, and what he did with TCU is perhaps unparalleled in the history of college football. Just taking them from a uh, random nobody school to uh, you know multiple times BCS buster playoff contender, um, and that's extremely impressive. That being said, in his later years, uh, it, it did appear the focus became um, more so on a certain win total. Uh, that was kind of a career horizon and less perhaps optimizing, mostly because that optimizing on a year-to-year -year basis would make some hard choices about personnel where he would have to turn over and say, guys that have been loyal to me and been with me for a long time, uh, I, I think firing you right now would be a really bad thing for, for what I want to do. So it did look like he thought he was going to be able to hit that win total and kind of transition out into the, out, out into the sunset. Um, that timeline didn't work out. Uh, they, they really couldn't figure out a way to modernize the offense. The offensive line play and recruitment pipeline especially was really, really, really messed up. And uh, as we know, it's really hard to get out of an offensive line hole. And so they, they weren't able to do the work to kind of even set the offense up to run a competent offense there um, over the time optimizing. And so I think that it just became a matter of um, the day-to-day -day running of a program, Gary Patterson just wasn't able to do that at the level he had done in the past, and there needed to be a change. Obviously, that was there's some bad blood there a little bit, but you know he he went to Texas. Um, he's not at Texas anymore. He's back in Fort Worth. Maybe there's a little bit of reconciliation again. Like you said, the guy has a statue, so uh, hopefully he can kind of come back and be that that figurehead. Uh, but it did become a clear that in the day-to-day -day business of running a highly competitive college football team parallel with the resources TCU had, he just wasn't able to do that anymore. What I find interesting is as soon as the job came open, Parker, it was like Sonny Dykes to lose. It was just assumed that he was going to be the guy. I'm curious how you felt about that at the time, because in retrospect, we know it worked out, but it's not like this guy was Nick Saban, right? He had a familiarity with Texas, which was important, had a reputation for building good offenses, which TCU was clearly in need of. But he won one bowl game in 12 seasons as a head coach, maybe some qualifiers there as to why, but it didn't seem like, at least on the surface, this was so sure of a thing. And to be frank, the jury's still out. Um, he took over a team that was super experienced, brought back more returning production than almost anyone in the country, had guys that had played together for a while. And yes, he brought in some key transfers and did some things to kind of right the ship in terms of vibes. But um, but. TBD. Like, we don't know if this is a flash in the pan. I, um, I, I think that a lot of TCU fans kind of had him pegged as a name from when he was at TCU before SMU. You know, he came and, and was a special right, assistant right. and he and Gary Patterson got along. That seemed like a natural kind of passing of the baton. I don't think we knew the timeline, but um, I mean, we heard Sonny Dyke's wife was looking at houses in November in Fort Worth. So like it was kind of we, we kind of knew where this was going. And I think that at the time, uh, there there were some concerns about potentially looking at a, nat uh, a national search as opposed to just handing it to the guy across the Metroplex who who kind of seemed next in line. Um, certainly, with with uh, without going all the way down this rabbit hole, there have been concerns about the people that he's brought he's brought on with his staff and kind of where they've been historically in the landscape of college football and Texas. Um, but it does seem like he 
is well suited to use the resources that TCU has to maximize TCU's potential, which is really important because TCU is going to be a team that has to punch above their weight, right? They have to, you know, their enrollment's small. Um, they have to, they have to be able to, to kind of keep up with the big boys. And, and at SMU, he really felt like they didn't have the resources that he needed. He was asking for them. They weren't really providing them. And at TCU, he kind of has everything at his disposal. So I think that he's demonstrated when circumstances are right, when the team's at the top of the development cycle, um, and he, he can put his team in the position to take advantage of a few breaks and compete for a national championship, which can't be said of every college football coach in the nation. What was his specific strength last year? Obviously, inheriting a roster is nothing he can control necessarily, but his specific strength for a team that returned what they returned, was it a, a cultural thing? Was it a demeanor thing? Obviously, this is a team who found themselves in a number of precarious situations over the course of the season at halftimes and fourth quarters and overtimes, etc. What was it about his specific uh I guess, fingerprints on the program that that was so different from the Gary Patterson era? I think there's three key things. One, uh, one the, the vibes, which I'll explain. Two, halftime, uh, halftime adjustments. And three, the, the transfer portal. I think he did all three of those things very, very well in year one. And in terms of controlling what he can control, those three things are really important. So first, vibes. Um, he opened spring practice. Um, a lot of TCU fans kind of felt beleaguered by the secrecy and kind of the walls around the program. And Sonny Dyke said, it's okay to be a TCU fan. Come on, let's have fun. He did an interview with, you know, Barstool and all these people, stuff that you would have never imagined TCU's head coach doing. So opened up media access. I think absolutely that contributed to getting Max Duggan to the Heisman ceremony. Uh, just the, you know, all of their memes and, and embracing Robert Griffin and getting all the airtime because of that. And, um, that, that wasn't the case at TCU, and I think nationally that really helped TCU's perspective. Um, second halftime adjustments, you look at the leads that they had, the comebacks that they made um, all season. He hired guys in Garrett Riley and in Joe Gillespie and said, you know football, you know the vision we want to enact, I'm going to trust you, and we're also going to hold that with an open hand. We're going to say, if something's not working, let's switch it. Uh, and again, a lot of people felt like kind of in the past that um, – there's a little bit more normative commitment to a certain way of playing football. The phrase win by one still uh, invokes some kind of flashbacks of, of terror for <laughs> TCU fans. Um, and they're saying, no, we're going to do whatever it takes to win. Uh, you look at the difference. There were, there were multiple times where TCU had the ball, you know, two minutes, one and a half minute in the, in the first half, and they tried to score. The SMU game, perfect example. In the past, uh, the TCU teams would not have had that ruthlessness of let's max maximize every moment. They would have said, no, let's be conservative. Let's kind of take w what's there. So that change along with the halftime adjustments, I think was really, really good for them. Um, lastly, you look at the transfer portal. I mean, you can't imagine this team without Mark Perry, kind of the run stopping safety who led the team uh, uh, in, in tackles last year, him and, and a couple other guys just came in, plugged a hole, Jared Wiley, the tight end who could block and catch, um, Alan Ali, the, the center from SMU who shored up an interior offensive line who had just been terrible. You know, he brought in guys at key positions, kind of bottlenecks that were keeping TCU back from success, identified those, and then hit really well on the guys he brought in. And so those three things, I think, are, are really, really what he did in year one that, that, that kind of maximized TCU's potential and set them up to, again, they got breaks, right? They got breaks all season. But if you're not set up to take advantage of those breaks, you're not going to have the kind of season that TCU had last year. Uh, upon further reflection, how do you feel about what the defense did? Obviously, uh, um, an amount of attention, a huge amount of attention will go to the Max Duggan evolution, ending up as a Heisman finalist, Quentin Johnston, all the firepower on offense. I think we saw this TCU defense peak, and correct me if I'm wrong, probably with the Texas game, with you know game day in town, on the road, and just I don't think Texas scored an offensive touchdown in that game. Uh, it was a, a fumble return at the end. Um, what was it about the defense when it was clicking and – is this something that you see as a, a first step towards uh, a more balanced team? Or was it, as you mentioned, the transfers, the upperclassmen, um, and it was you know the right defense at the right time? The defense definitely struggled early on. Um, you know, with the SMU game and, and giving up a lot of points there and even to Kansas where yeah. there was just a lot of stuff they hadn't seen. And then later down the road, you look at the total points, you know, 24 to Texas Tech, 28 to Baylor, 
both of those teams threw the kitchen sink at a, at a defense that was in their first year under a defensive coordinator. Baylor, I'm sure you guys saw, they did that crazy, like the guards kind of did a pirouette almost. Yeah. And they did this funky running stuff, just right. trying to con- confuse and poke holes in a defense under, under a first time defensive coordinator, which makes a lot of sense. Um, a couple things happen on the defense that I think are really, really important for how TCU's defense kind of solidified. One, Dom Williams, the big man, 52, the nose tackle. TCU moves from a 4-2-5 to a three down kind of alignment. Uh, the nose tackle is the most important player. They lost out on Jackson player from Tulsa, who many thought would come with Joe Gillespie and kind of be the anchor of this defense. Don Williams was 17 in spring camp this year, comes in, contributes, plays in an all, you know, an all conference level in the middle there. That changes everything. TC has not had good interior defensive line play for a while. Um, Secondly, D. Winters and Dylan Horton are both super athletic guys who are kind of playing unnatural positions in the 425, but they're really smart. And so they're able to play well. Uh, this year, Gillespie kind of unlocked that next level by putting D. Winters in that rover right. role. And he was able to pass cover, and rush, and move back. And then Dylan Horton, you know, journeyman who's been around and played so hard, really thrived as an edge. So you had three guys kind of uh, played positions that really, really suited to them and uh, improved. You also saw a longer athletic leash. Gary Patterson's defense is, I know the play. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. And if they if they score on this play, it's because you didn't do what I told you to do. Right. Um, and he's great at it. You, you know the memes about Gary being sweaty and loud on the sidelines he, He's because he's working so hard calling those plays. Gillespie's a little bit more if-then reaction. I'm going to tell you how to approach this, and then you react. And so I think a couple guys, um, Bud Clark is a name you'll hear a ton this fall. I think, again, the safety wasn't totally figuring it out in Gary Patterson's offense or defense, but under Gillespie, a little bit more simplified, a little bit more relying on your instincts and they're able to thrive. So um, again, really hard to install a defense, such a dramatic change from a four down to a three down like that with the personnel, but by giving some of those guys a chance to get into a position that was a little more natural for them and a little bit more instinctive, they, they, they thrived and they were timely. They weren't great, but when you needed a stop, they got a stop, and and that went a long way this year. And when you look at those close games, that almost comes to define the TCU season, right? Even if it's you know a score that looks like it wasn't necessarily close, you know the West Virginia game, you mentioned the Kansas game. Was it the defense that you were more sure of, the offense that you were more sure of? Uh, we had the slow starts with TCU games. What was it about late in games that I guess TCU fans were most worried about and most confident in? How many players in the nation uh, would you rather have taking a last minute drive than Max Duggan? That's true. Um, I mean, last year, you look at that Kansas State end of the game. He just drove down in sheer force of will. Uh, some some absurd number of rushing yards on that 90-yard drive and just sacrificing the body. I think his experience and Sonny Dykes um, and Garrett Riley's reliance on him and saying, we're going to trust you to, to make the right throw. Um I will say it's a lot easier to make those throws when Quentin Johnston is waiting down right. downfield and is a big target for you. So I think absolutely TCU was uh, trusting the offense a lot more. Were you shocked and by the, the way? Defense was doing enough to Were hold you on. shocked by your own confidence in Max Duggan after just a, a career marred with like, is it good Max Duggan week or bad Max Duggan week? Is that wild to think about that that was the most confident thing you had in your brain? Oh, my friends, this is such a deserved victory lap. I'm absolutely going to take it on your show. Please, please. From day one, I and my my co-host Grant McGalliard over on Purple Theory have been the staunchest of Max Duggan defenders. Not saying he's the best, not saying that, but saying in 2019, 20, 21, they're extenuating circumstances outside his control and that TCU should be able to design an offense that helps them compete at a national level with Max Duggan through thick and thin didn't want to bench him for Chandler Morris didn't want to bench him for Stefan Brown that's a whole other thing um but but said you can win with Max Duggan and so this year was absolutely delicious to see that come to fruition and one I'm happy for him kids stuck around took took blows literally had a heart condition thought he was going to maybe never play football mm-hmm. again and, uh, and came back and, and, and gets the recognition he deserves. So it is absolutely wild. And it is one of the most satisfying football experiences of wow. my, of my life to see him finally reach the potential that he, that we thought he could for, for so long. Uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but TCU <laughs> lost in the championship 65 to seven. Oh no, they didn't. Has there that. been any, you're thinking of another team tied. Totally oh, no, different happened. situation. Right, 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 right. Has there been any fallout to the way that game went down? Um, 
I think that the median TCU fan would say that anything that happened in the postseason was just lanyap. Like just for TCU to have a season where they felt good about football for the first time in a couple of years is, is really, really important. Um, the fallout from that is one, I think a lot of people um, were concerned about like, did TCU actually prep for that game super well? Because you look at like Garrett Riley went off to Clemson and um, there were some guys who, who set out, couldn't hurt, like Kendra Miller ended up being hurt and not playing. And so there, there were some questions about that. Um, but I think that's easily forgotten just because TCU did beat every big 12 opponent on their, on their roster. And I think a lot of TCU fans are, are pretty grounded um, about that. It certainly is not what you want. Um, but I don't think anyone going into that game thought TCU was going to uh, do anything different than, than get beat soundly. Um, you know, right. the degree and, right. and we hadn't seen Georgia kind of stop. So I don't think that game specifically did that. I think that it definitely cast a bra- background for uh, a lot of TCU fans, myself included, to be a little bit skeptical and perhaps frustrated with how TCU replaced Garrett Riley. Um, mm. And so if you start, you know, one thing on its own is not necessarily bad, but you start adding things up and then it's looking at some guys that left during spring, there's going to be returning production. I think there's a little bit more uncertainty than if they had gone and lost, you know, 34 to 17 or something in that, in that game. Right. Well, you know, the risk for Sonny Dykes, of course, is being a victim of his own success now because it's extremely hard to top what they did in his first season in 2022. Do you feel like as a as a TCU fan, did the success that the Horned Frogs had last season almost recalibrate what expectations are moving forward? Or are fans grounded enough to the extent that they're still viewing last season as potentially a one-off, potentially a flash-in-the-pan type year? Um. Well, I, I'm, yeah, I don't, I don't know how grounded fans are generally. People <laughs> definitely true. let their, let their expectations run wild. Um, I, I said, and I think a lot of us in, 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 that were talking about TCU at the time kind of agreed eight and four last year would have been an amazing season. And TCU was yeah. four oh, and yeah. one and one score games. Those very easily could have gone the other way. Um, and, uh, and so those the, you know, the, the narrowness of the margin, kind of the stressfulness of season certainly keeps that in check. I also think that more people are kind of getting in tune to this idea that the development cycles of the Big 12 are pretty unique in college football. You look at Iowa State, you look at Baylor, you look at Oklahoma State last year, you look at TCU this year. Um, somebody's just going to rise to the top every year just because they hit the development cycle at the top of their talent. It's all coalescing and they get a couple breaks. And so I think you have to understand that when you lose your best players, you get worse. I, I don't know if that's a groundbreaking to say. Um, again, right, right. mostly this is proof of concept that Sonny Dykes, when things have all gone right, when the roster is where it needs to be, can manage a team at a high level competing for a national championship, which you can't save every coach. There are still questions to be answered about whether he can create the conditions for the roster to be where it needs to be. Right. Well, that that's actually a great segue into my next question about recruiting. Because if you think about it, right, teams like Georgia and Alabama are already sort of at terminal velocity when it comes to recruiting. You can win a national championship. You can win a playoff game. It's hard to boost those recruiting efforts more than they're already boosted. They're already recruiting at such an elite level. But TCU getting to the championship in the manner that they did first year under a new coach, that's a program changing type of event, type of thing. Are they using that boost to their advantage on the trail, are they using it in the manner that they should? How are they taking advantage of like this newfound success on the recruiting trail? Well, they certainly have the access uh, to talent that, that a lot of their teams teams don't, and they've used it well. They've been, you know, the, the the Big Twelve. You look at team talent composite has been Oklahoma, Texas, little gap, TCU, big gap, everyone else. And so under Gary Patterson, they were still doing a good job of amassing talent. Um, in, in the Big 12, uh, especially in the era of the transfer portal that faltered a little bit. They were out of the top five, I think, two times in the last four years, which under Gary Patterson was kind of unprecedented. And so Sunny Dykes is riding the ship. They're going and getting athletic guys. Um, they are also doing a little bit of roster churn. I think um, you just saw Jordan Hudson, who was supposed to be, uh, I think, on three at one point, had him as a five star. Maybe Riles did. Uh, receiver didn't really get involved last year. He kind of left. The, the The fit wasn't necessarily there. They're doing a little bit of roster churn, um, but they're certainly able to attract talent. I think the big difference for 
Sonny Dykes and his kind of TCU going forward is with so much talent in Texas, TCU becomes a place where you can say to guys like Jojo Earl, for instance, Mm -hmm. come home. Be a, be a little closer yeah. to things. Let's right. let's let's get a fresh start. Look what I've done in the transfer portal. I mean, how many quarterbacks from Texas has Sonny Dykes turned uh, trash to treasure, right? And, and had the ability to do that. And so I'm interested to see what he can do with the transfer portal, um, as well as maintaining that kind of top 20, top 25 consistent year in, year out, year out class. Um, I don't know that after, you know, the Rose Bowl in 2014, that... Um, they're, they're, they, you know, TCU isn't isn't as weird. Uh, people, when I went to school at TCU, thought I went to the University of Tennessee Chattanooga <laughs> or something. Didn't know what it was at all. Um, that, TCU is certainly a national brand, and so it doesn't hurt to get in front of that with that. But in terms of a recruiting bump, I think it's a little bit more of a recruiting ballast. It just helps you continue that momentum and makes you a little bit more attractive for those all important transfers. Do you think this is a staff and a uh, a program with the infrastructure to now that you have the Texas and Oklahoma vacuum in the big 12, like, is this a, a staff and program comprised of recruiting killers? Is it a priority in the way that it's, you know, you mentioned Gary Patterson put together a number of very good classes, but in this, you know, 2023, 2024, 2025, do you get the sense that the aggression is there to match or exceed who they're recruiting against? Um, I am, skeptical of that a little bit just because tc's lost out on a couple quarterbacks i think they really would have liked to have this this offseason in this cycle um mm-hmm. uh, a couple of guys have flipped you look at um the you know there, there, there's great guys like anthony jones who was at memphis comes over a guy that people like great great with texas paul gonzalez been there forever has great relationships with the texas high schools gets the dbs into the room um and so I think there are guys that are really, really good at, at kind of isolating talent, building relationships, keeping those pipelines open. Uh, Gillespie, you know, had a, had a couple guys that were just absolute studs at Tulsa and so has shown that he can find those guys on the rough. I think it's different to find a three star who you believe is underrated versus finding uh, multiple four stars and winning those kind of higher, higher recruiting battles. So we'll see. Also, you look at the, you know, the, the offensive coordinator that they brought in um, doesn't necessarily has, hasn't necessarily recruited the guys that he's been successful with. So again, open question, he's come in and taken other people's pieces and, and done okay with it. Can he kind of build from nothing? Cause, cause right now with the turnover that TC is facing um, in terms of talent and development cycles, they, they are going to have to kind of build again. Do you feel for Chandler Morris the way you felt for Max Duggan? Are you a, an early believer? Do you see the talent? Do you see the ability to construct a team around him to win on a national level in that same way? Or are you withholding judgment for now? I am a little bit more worried about Chandler Morris's development because he was at o- OU, moved here, didn't play meaningful snaps. I'm just worried he hasn't had enough meaningful snaps to progress along the way he should, which is a similar concern as Max Duggan. Duggan was a higher rate of recruit than Morris, I think is, is important to note. Um, again, it felt like that was a very easy, um, oh, TCU brought in a guy from Oklahoma. He should compete for the job. But, but I mean, it's not like he's a bad quarterback. I think he looked really bad in his debut at Colorado before he got injured. A little bit deer in the headlights. Um, obviously, the Baylor game will live forever in infamy. If you go yeah. talk to our Baylor, our Baylor friends, however few and far between they may be, <laughs> they'll tell us that um, there were some extenuating circumstances about preparation and participation that that kind of had Baylor in a bad spot for that game. And we can't forget he played the Oklahoma State game the next week after and got absolutely demolished. I think there's some right. limitations with physical size um, in terms of what he might do going forward. He's got it between the years. I think he's pretty accurate. He is about. 50 pounds lighter than KJ Jefferson and uh, five or six inches shorter, which if you look at what uh, Arkansas's offense was able to do last year, I don't know how well that translates. So TCU has a lot of speed. Um, Morris is definitely a spark plug. I think there's a world where TCU can compete for a big 12 championship with Morris at the, um, at the helm. The ceiling is there. If we're talking about medium, most like most likely outcome. I'm a little bit more worried about Morris just because of that development has been so stunted with the un- instability, the movement around, and, and that he just hasn't gotten those meaningful reps over the course of his career. So TCU hits the portal, hopefully to surround Chandler Morris, whoever starts a quarterback with uh, new talent, with losing a couple major pieces uh, offensive skill-wise. Do you see immediate impact? Do you, you know, wait and see, you know, they go to LSU, they go to Alabama, and these are guys that they bring in that were highly rated recruits that didn't necessarily, you know, see the field that often or saw the field and then saw lesser, a lesser role. You mentioned Jojo Earl. What is the state of the roster 
post at least second portal uh, swing through the uh, through the country. They are definitely going to have some questions on the offensive line again. You lose Steve Avila, one of the you know uh, just a, just an awesome offensive interior offensive line and presence for a while. And when you lose your best players, Quentin Johnson, Darius Davis, um, Tay Barber, you're, you're going to get worse. That's just how it's going to happen. I think they'll rely on Jared Wiley a little bit more in the in the intermediate passing game. As for additions, JoJo Earl, I think ceiling's very high. We don't know what he is. We don't know if he's healthy. Tommy Brockmeyer, uh, tackle could shore up that offensive line. Is he going to be able to be healthy? Is he back where he needs to be in terms of game readiness? Um, one guy that I'm really intrigued by um, that I think a lot of folks will um, maybe maybe not seem as sexy on the, on the face, uh, John Paul Richardson from Oklahoma State. I think yeah. that he really got pegged as a, a number one receiver. He got a lot of pressure, had a lot of gravity, and that's just not the kind of receiver he is. In TCU's offense, they should be able to spread things out a little bit more, have a little bit more attention otherwise, and, and JPR could be very, very, very good in that role. Um, and when you talk about replacing Quentin Johnston, you look to a guy like Savion Williams, had a little bit of trouble with his hands in the past, but has the build and and the experience to potentially have a very good receiving season so they're, they're gonna turn over some of those guys um but i, I you know the the other big loss is going to be kendry miller who's going to fill in there is that going to be a monty bailey trent battle um in, in the backfield there just a lot of question marks uh, i think tcu has a very high ceiling this year um but I think their volatility, their uncertainty is a lot higher than it was last year. So a lot of these guys you could talk yourself into, yes, the inside slot. You put Earl on the left, you put Richardson on the right, you run mesh 30 times a game, you're gonna, you're gonna score some points. Um, can they do that consistently? Can they adjust? Can they counter punch, especially with a new offensive coordinator? Um, I, I think they've done a decent job kind of addressing some of those issues. But if the interior offensive line is as bad as it looked in the spring game. And if the quarterback play is, is not what it, what it should be, a lot of that's going to be moot. Uh, all these things are dependent on each other, obviously. Whose offense was it last year? Whose offense is it this year? Last year, it was Max Duggan's offense, even though it was really Quentin Johnston's offense, just because Max was not running as much. But um, I, I think it really was Max Duggan's offense. Um, this year, if things are going well, I think it's Savion Williams' offense. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I more meant like, was it Sonny Dykes' offense versus Garrett oh. Riley's <laughs> offense? And this <laughs> year, this year, is it Sonny Dykes' offense or Kendall Bryles' offense, right? Who is it, you know, the Dykes' offense with Bryles' elements? Was it last year Garrett Riley's really like coming to fruition as a play call? Like who, who is the, the mastermind or who was and who is? Great. That felt like a very hot takey question. So I'm glad no, 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 it was not. I, I apologize <laughs> if it came off that way. No, all good. All good. Yes. So last year it was Garrett Riley's offense. I think if you've studied Lincoln Riley, if you studied Garrett Riley, you know what they, you know what they're, they're running the, mm -hmm. you know, the sting, the drag, the leak, all of that stuff. Um, like that, that touchdown that Quentin Johnson scored against Michigan was the most classic Lincoln Riley play I've ever seen in my time. Like it was the wide receiver drag almost at the line of scrimmage, completely open and then sprints away. Um, and so I, I think that what happened is Garrett Riley had the play sheet um, and Sonny Dykes advised at times and said, maybe we do this, maybe we do this, but, but Garrett Riley was fully in control. I expect that to continue uh, to continue this year uh, as well. I expect the offensive coordinator to uh, kind of take over um, and Dykes to be more ad uh, more advisory. I, I believe that Sonny Dykes is shaping himself to be kind of one of the modern GM style coaches where mm -hmm. he's not going to call plays. He's going to be overseeing things while the offense is talking or, or running plays, talking or whatever. He's going to be talking to other players and kind of managing all around as well. So I, I don't think that Dykes will be any more involved in the offense, um, which could mean that TC's offense looks dramatically different given you know what Arkansas did last year and what Garrett Riley was prone to do. Um, last year as well. You're projecting, I think, cautious optimism with regard to the new cycle of offensive skill players, but you also mentioned playmakers on all three levels on defense. And is there a, a position group? Is there an area of the field that you have as much concern about on defense as you seem to have with the uh, interior offensive line? Well, the, the, the linebackers is going to be hard to lose a guy like D winters, right? Like that's, I mean, you just have a guy who's kind of your quote unquote quarterback, um, and, and, and a guy who really, really kind of inspired the team at, at times. 
Um, there, there are some guys who play really good roles. You look at like Abe Kamara in that kind of safety linebacker role, and then Mark Perry will come back. Um, how they replace the linebackers is, is going to be the biggest issue. That was a position group that was hurt, that was just extremely hurt last year. Johnny Hodges went down and, and guys you'd almost never heard of were, were playing, stepping up, but, but still not ideal situations. There are, some, there are some question marks in that group that have to hit their absolute top ceiling for this game, this team to roll. Um, Marcel Brooks, haven't heard from him in a little bit. Shad Banks, again, a star in that 2021 Baylor game, but hasn't really made those plays um, since. And, and some other guys who have gotten some experience, but but I, I think that the linebacker position is just going to be super important for how TCU wants to kind of restore the balance. Dom Williams comes back there. They've got Josh Newton out at corner. Um, and so have some anchor points. And again, Perry there as, as kind of your run stopper uh, in the safety. But but the, the, the linebacker position is, is the biggest worry for me in the defense. TC's run defense was abysmal in 2021. It was just bad in 2022. Can they take that step to make it good enough to give the offense a little bit more breathing room so we're not kicking a field goal with you know zero seconds left right. on the clock to try and win a team that you should probably handily beat? Parker, how does TCU see itself in the remodeled version of the Big 12? Because the top, conference... Top dog, top dog yeah. Ty, top frog. I mean, look, the, yeah, the, com- sure. <laughs> the, the conference is weirdly in a very stable place, despite much of the narrative cool. before Brett Yormark got there and the Pac-12 started its media rights negotiations and whatnot. It seems like they're in a pretty good spot. And though it sucks to have Oklahoma and Texas leave the conference, that does create a bit of a vacuum at the top, or at least the perceived top. TCU was there this year, got to the championship. Um, Not to ask the same question over and over again about expectations moving forward, but it has to at least reshape how the fan base views the team, how the team itself, the program itself fits in or feels it fits into this I don't know, broader conversation about the Big 12 and college football. Have you given much thought to that? Yes, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about what 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 the conference is going to look like going forward. And obviously, you know, Chris Kleiman at Kansas State is building really solid foundations. I think they have the opportunity to perhaps make the biggest um, leap in terms of being there at the top of the conference. I think in the new Big 12, given that we have schedule imbalance now, Right. And given that there's so many more teams and talent is dispersed, I don't think we'll see a team go to the Big 12 championship seven years in a row like Oklahoma did. Um, and, and this year and last year were kind of the first inklings of what that might look like. The teams that get to the top are the ones who you know have the talent there and the schedule breaks in their favor. They have the five home games instead of four and, and all that. But TCU's concern, I think, is the floor. If TCU's floor is more so um, that five and four, four and five, uh, you know, absolute worst season is your four and five in Big 12 play. Um, that's that's going to be a, a marked step from kind of where they were. You're still going to yeah. bounce up and down. I don't expect TCU to be in the Big 12 championship game every year, but I expect them to be, you know, th- saying more often than not, darn, if one or two things had gone differently, I really feel like we could have competed for that and been in that game. That will be a much higher floor. So when I say TCU top dog, I think they have – uh, facilities that are as good as, if not better than anyone else, they have, you know, access to the Texas talent. Um, and they have some really good branding things going on, uh, that, that I think recruits like, and are are active there. Um, and with the history of recruiting and the history of performance of TCU, I think they expect to be the, or if not the, one of the two to three premier teams of the new big 12. The schedule this year looks backloaded. Um, they will have, I think, ample opportunity early to try and figure out what their new rhymes and rhythms are, but to close out the season on the road at K-State, on the road at Texas Tech, Texas, Baylor, Oklahoma, on the road, that's a really tough stretch, Parker. It's hard to envision another Cinderella season like the one we saw last year. What What is a reasonable expectation for you as you project forward into 23? Yeah, I, so I have not done win totals, but it definitely will be something that is hard for TCU to reconcile with, I think having a much better record in the first uh, eight games of the season, and then they have the bye, and then the last four. Um, I, I'm going to stick with my 
with my eight and four being a pretty good season for TCU this year, that's a reduction of five win or four wins in the regular season. Um, and, and not ideal, but, but certainly means, Hey, even with the turnover, we can beat the teams that were more talented than TCU right. wasn't doing that in the past, missing the bowl in 2019. And, and with the season in 2021 being so, uh, abysmal, if they can beat teams that they are more talented than, I think that, that, that establishes their floor is pretty high eight and four, again, a pretty good season. Maybe, maybe sprinkle in there. Don't get embarrassed by Colorado. In game one. <laughs> sure. Just don't just don't make a mistake. Yeah. And I think there's a lot longer leash. <laughs> I am interested to see how they handle kind of the grind. You look at how much of a factor injuries played in the Big 12 last year. TCU has a, bu- uh, a buy on October 28th. Um, they normally have like a week four buy and then play. Last year they played 10 straight games, which makes their undefeated season that much crazier because they were able to, you know, sustain that week in and week out with a later buy. I wonder if they get a little bit more of a, uh, a breather before they go through that gauntlet, but make no mistake. They, they absolutely have a gauntlet at the end of the season that it's going to be really, really hard to sustain any kind of level of performance um, that they did over the first, you know, eight games. Parker, my final question, our final question is, you know, we live in a, a chaotic world. We live in a, a turbulent time. And so one of the, the nice things to have is, something that we can count on, something we can look forward to, something we can just pencil in as being automatic. TCU does not have a Texas win on its schedule after this year. And that's just one of those things that we could count on. You just, you look at a schedule, you're like, well, TCU's going to be Texas. TCU doesn't have any receivers. They don't have any defensive linemen. Still going to be Texas. Uh, are, are you going to miss that sort of uh, automatic element of your your fall? Um, I, I, I certainly am, um, you know, in, in, in so much as we're looking at them this fall, I think we saw, you know, TCU beat Texas a lot uh, early in the Big 12. They used to do it on Thanksgiving. Texas got tired of, <laughs> of losing on Thanksgiving. They moved that game off of that. Texas got tired of losing to TCU. They, they you know, get, get rid of that game. I, I think that that is a little bit sad and kind of feels like, all right, the, you know, the new era is here. Um, and it is different to have, you know, S, uh, Houston on your, on your, uh, schedule. And, sure. And that's actually a pretty good rivalry. That's kind of fun. Yeah. That's, that's something we should get behind. Um, I think it does make games like, uh, Texas tech Baylor, uh, more, more important as, as well. So going forward, it'll be interesting to see kind of how the new four teams and the rivalries happen. A lot of people forget TCU and BYU was kind of nasty for yeah. a couple of years. I think that's something that potentially TCU fans would be really excited about playing and, and winning. Parker Fleming, Stats O War on Twitter. Where else can folks find your work? That is the um, the the best place right now. The BetUS College Football Show will be kicking things off again this summer. Um, you can find that on YouTube. And uh, I'll shout out, uh, go follow Sumer Sports, doing some more stuff on the, uh, the NFL side of things, but a lot of cool, interesting information. I'm tweeting and posting over there as well for, for, for those guys. So those are the best places to find me. Love it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom. We will definitely touch base at some point in the future as things get rolling here. TCU with the follow-up campaign for Sunny Dykes.